They're very friendly this morning, Todd. Okay, guys, if you would, how about standing up for this first song and sing along with us, okay? Guys sounded great. Welcome. It's good to see y'all today. How many of y'all began melting as soon as you stood outside this morning? And then you got in the car and you started feeling better. So hey, we made we 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 overcame one thing this morning from melting. So we're all good and we're whole. We're whole because we're here together. We're among each other. We are among friends. We are among family. We are among those who worship the one true risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And it is great to see you, especially those of you who have been invited today to come for our Bring a Friend to Church Day. And I am glad that you came. I did do my part, and I did invite a friend, and he would have came. He would have been here with me today, but... He had a late night last night, and he told me that's why. But you'll get to meet Sammy eventually. Love him, leave him, I don't know, that's up to you, but you will get to meet my friend Sammy. But if you'll turn on the back of your worship bulletin, if you look, we've got a few announcements. Remember the 29th is uh, bring a, uh, a movie night here at Mount Pisgah. We're going to have it in the fellowship hall, 6 o'clock. We'll have popcorn and refreshments. Um, today we're doing uh, Lunch Punch at Paradise Acres. Come and join us. It's on your own, but you get to sit among friends. And 
they even have planned gatherings and we have more people that come. So they'll reserve a few tables for us in the back. We'll sit, eat together, fellowship, and have a good time together. Vacation Bible School, August 7th through the 9th. You can look at that. Volunteers are needed. Um, church social meet and greet, August the 20th from 3 to 5. We want to let you know about that. What that is, it's a day of activities, or at least an evening of activities. We're going to do things. You're going to get an opportunity to do some painting. We'll provide uh, the canvas and the paints supplied, or if you are of that ilk and you want to bring your own, you may do that. Uh, plastic bag weaving for rugs, wood crafts, board games. Bring your favorite game if you want to play board games. Uh, and, of course, socializing, which is the benefit of it all. You know, when I, when I pray uh, a blessing upon a meal, there are two things in particular that I ask, and I don't know if you've listened. Bless this food that it give our body strength, and this time together that it uplift our souls. When we're together, nothing like it. Smiles and love, also being able to share troubles and problems we are there for one another because we are family. Janice has another announcement that she would like to make. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And it's been wonderful to hug necks of folks that I haven't seen in a while, and especially not here in this church. So thank you. Glad to see you. Women on Mission is again promoting the Christmas in August program this year. And this time we've decided to adopt two missionaries. The first one is Jay Watkins from Valdosta, Georgia. Jay works with Camp Rock, which offers monthly mentoring camps for foster care children and at-risk youth. The second guy is Matt Hayden from Porcupine, South Dakota. Isn't that a nice name, Porcupine? Yeah. Okay. Matt uh, assists Creators Fellowship to provide meals every week for dialysis patients. These missionaries request gift cards from Sam's, Walmart, or Visa gift cards. However, we never turn down just plain old cash. So if you prefer to give a check or money, please designate it for Christmas in August. Last year, we sent our missionary $410. So, hey, let's see if we can surpass that a little bit this year. Thank you. So if you will, keep that in mind as you plan your giving and how you want to spend your time as we minister together those in need. also want to bring attention to the prayer list on the back with Barbara Kane, Margaret Cogburn, Jerry Didway, Hazel Hinton, Chris Colston, Joe Adesso, Cindy Hensley, and uh, we have one to add, Kelly Hilliard. We want to be praying for these and others. And we want to have a prayer of thanksgiving uh, on 725. Lawrence and Betty Burke will be celebrating their wedding anniversary. So you may want to give them a call and say congratulations and thank Betty for all these years that she's had to put up with Lawrence <laughs> and say thank you for that blessing. But we also want to say hello to you that are watching us via Facebook and online. We're glad that you're with us this morning. We hope that you'll come back and see us, especially at some of these other events that we have mentioned. Is there anything else we need to be made aware of this morning? I thought we had a hand raised earlier. Did you have something you needed to share? You brought a friend to church. Yeah, many of you brought friends to church, and we are grateful that you did this morning. Not only all, uh, not only all of us old folks, but some of us young folks brought friends to church as well, and we're grateful that you have been a part. And we're grateful that you're a part of our congregation. You are. You have to say, so thank you for My doing friend Your friend is God. Ooh. <laughs> Oh, things that make you think. 
I think that'll preach this morning. But, but welcome. We are glad you are here. We're going to sing another, another chorus now. And if you can remain seated as we sing. So sing along please this morning. This morning, as we enter into a time of prayer, I invite you, where you are, to take a moment. Take time to be silent before God. You know, often we come into churches and into places of worship, and for some of us, our morning has been chaotic, getting ready, getting out of bed. We may wake up, wake up late. We may have had a busy week. And we need time to simply sit in God's presence to allow God to speak to us and for us to speak to God. As I saw yesterday, a friend shared a, a statement that sometimes when I pray, I simply allow God to look at me and look back at God. So take that moment and then when we come together we will read the words of our prayer of confession. But spend this time with you and God as you still yourself.
And now let us bring our hearts together as we read the words of this prayer in unison. Lord Jesus, you used your hands to heal, to lift up, and to bless desolate lives. Forgive us when we keep our hands at our side, when we could be reaching out in love. Lord Jesus, you used your hands to bear the burdens of others and to feed the hungry. Forgive us when we use our hands to take care of ourselves without any thought for those who are hungry. Lord Jesus, you used your hands to welcome and to include those who were outcasts. Forgive us when we clench our fists and exclude people simply because they are different from us. Lord Jesus, open our hands and our hearts to love as you love and to care as you care and forgive us when we resist doing so. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, before you is a world that is lost. But depending on whom those words come from, O oh God, it means different things. Too often, O oh God, we have placed our judgment in the path of your judgment. And we declare lost what is different than us. But, oh God, what really needs to happen in this world that is lost is that those who claim to be found, those who truly know the way of Christ, need to find the path. Those who truly need to find the path need to lose judgment and need to find within their place love and openness both to proclaim the gospel and to receive a gospel that challenges them to walk closer to you than ever before. Oh God, the path that walks close to you often burns because it is so bright. It convicts us of our wrongs. It convicts us of our sin. The path, oh God, that is closer to you causes us to do things which in our humanness we find disgusting. It often goes against everything that we believed you said only to find the true meaning of what you said. It causes us to step outside a world of comfort and acceptance into a world that is often ostracized. It causes, it causes us to step fully into the places where you stepped. Among those that the elites judged It causes us to live among those that you had to fight for. That you had to fight to love. Oh God, please, we beg of you that we may truly find the way not just the way of the masses, O oh God,
but the true path, the narrow path that you call us all to walk and that truly does not lead to a life of acceptance. Oh God, may we hear your word and may your spirit be revealed to us today. Amen.
I invite you to turn in your scriptures this morning to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, thir- th- uh, 13 through 22. Mary, this may be just for you after what we talked about at Bible study the other night. It was, it was really neat. We had a great conversation after Revelation or after our study and talked about things that, um, that, that we would be interested in studying and uh, wholeheartedly agreed with Mary that these smaller books, especially that are at the end of the uh, New, New Testament, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, um, Jude, all, all of them, and, and I... I use the terminology postcards, which is one of the things that I've heard them referred as, is postcards. Um, But there's great wisdom in them. But I invite you to turn as we read this today from the message. If with heart and soul you're doing good, do you think you can be stopped? Even if you suffer for it. You're still better off. Don't give the opposition a second thought. Through thick and thin, keep your hearts at attention and adoration before Christ, your Master. Be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks why you're living the way you are. And always with the utmost courtesy, keep a clear conscience before God so that when people throw mud at you, None of it will stick. They'll end up realizing that they're the ones who need a bath. It's better to suffer for doing good, if that's what God wants, than to be punished for doing bad. That's what Christ did definitively, suffered because of others' sins. The righteous one for the unrighteous ones. He went through it all, was put to death, and then made alive to bring us to God. He went and proclaimed God's salvation to earlier generations who ended up in the prison of judgment because they wouldn't listen. You know, even though God waited patiently all the days that Noah built his ship, only a few were saved then, eight to be exact, saved from the water by the water. The waters of baptism do that for you. Not by washing away dirt from your skin, but by presenting you through Jesus' resurrection before God with a clear conscience. Jesus has the last word on everything and everyone from angels to armies. He's standing right alongside God and what he says goes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to invite you to pray with me. I want to invite you to pray the Lord's Prayer with me. That was intentional and we didn't do that earlier to let you know. I want it to be separate. For you today who come that have never been here, for you who have been away for a long time, For better or worse, you are family now. (laughs) You're a part of us. You've shared yourself with us today. And as we pray this prayer, know that we are family as we pray together. Will you pray the Lord's Prayer with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I don't know how to start because there's a ton in this text. There's a ton in Peter. 
the fun part of what I read today or have read some of it seems like it stands a little bit in conflict with what Paul teaches. Or even as you read it, it's kind of like Peter heard it, but he really didn't hear all of it. He kind of missed it. And understanding context and when and why and where and how is essential. And I can be honest and say that I've not fully grasped the context of this writing. It's written to Christians who are suffering. Gentile Christians in particular. Which is fun to know that Peter, if you remember in the book of Acts, when you read, wondered if non-Jews could become Christian. Remember? Remember? Do you remember the piece where he was with Cornelius? And Peter was like, how do I want to go meet with him? He can't believe in Jesus. And he has this vision and he tells Peter, hey, who, who are you to say? I think Peter grew from that. So he's I find it humorous that he's the one writing this letter to these Gentiles that are being persecuted. More in the eastern edges of the Roman Empire. But nonetheless, no less dangerous a time. During a time of Nero where most of the persecution was at its worst for Christians. Now, as you think about persecution, don't think about armies really going door to door to look to say, you got any Christians in there? It's not necessarily that. It's how much do the local authorities really want to get favor with Nero? That's how you determine how difficult it is for Christians. And how much do your neighbors want to get in good with the local authorities? Probably what makes it worse is you don't know at any moment if somebody gets mad at you and they go to the local authority and say, hey, this person's a worshiper of Jesus Christ. Local authority may come and snatch you up in a minute, take you and do some of the most horrific things in the world to you. Or they may say, eh, I don't know. I almost think it would be better to know if you are in constant fear for your life. I think it's worse to wonder if, when it may happen no matter what. But regardless, there are people suffering. And let us also remember that there are those within the church that do not believe Gentiles have a part. That's a reality. Go back to the book of Romans and there are these different groups within the faith that are battling to figure out what is the church going to do and which way is it going to move forward. And you read some of this couched in 1 Peter. Peter and Paul and all of the other church fathers are trying to determine what is the culture for the Christian church. What's, how are we going to be moving forward? There's this passage in 1 Peter that talks, and we know the passage because it, we've read it in other places, that talks about wives submitting to your husbands and husbands being good to your wives. And it's simply there to set this culture against how Roman men treat their wives. trying to determine what we're going to do moving forward. But we come to this particular passage, this passage that is going to give hope. And to be honest with you, when I first read it, 
I struggled with it. And I still do. And to be honest with you, as I read about it and thought about it and listened to God, I'm, I'm going to be really honest. Right now I'm physically ill from these thoughts. I had a friend come in and sit in the office with me this morning and we talked about this and I am grateful for that time of listening and counsel. The struggle that I have is twofold. That we consider suffering a blessing. Think about it. it isn't it kind of arrogant that Peter's saying, Hey, yeah, you fear for your life, you're running around, hiding house to house, wondering if you're ever going to be killed or taken to the lion's den or burned like a torch out in the emperor's garden, you really wondered, hey, consider that a blessing. Does that seem Christian? Nah, honestly, not really. It really doesn't. But the other thing that has made me uncomfortable is I changed the context a little. Paul, or Peter probably is truly referring to Roman authorities and the power that they have in society and in culture, especially to manipulate and turn each other against each other. But I also thought about these Gentile Christians that are in churches with Jewish Christians, especially those that think they don't belong. And then I turned it on myself and wondered do I or have I ever made anyone suffer because I judged them I made them feel less than a brother or sister. I used to do the really good Christian thing. Just kind of wash it away and wash my conscience away. Oh, well, you know, we all have those brother and sister fights. And it's, it's no problem. It's really easy. I mean, I, I thought about the times. <laughs> I, I brag on this one. First time my sister came home from college. And she was just haughty and last time I told her and reminded her of this about oh six weeks ago she said she didn't remember it because I remember when I was really little one time if you notice my nose is crooked now everybody's going to notice it today but we were fighting on the floor and she put up she literally kicked me in the nose and I think that's why my my nose is off didn't make my glasses sit right. It's really a pain in the tail. You know, my glasses sit crooked. I blame her. But her first weekend home from college, she starts bossing me around. Actually, this may be prophetic because it may happen when Bailey comes home her first weekend from college with Cooper. But anyway, so she, we start arguing. And she reaches out and she grabs my hair and starts pulling on it. Which when I was younger, that would have been instant tears, game over, she wins. But I took her hand and I pulled it from my hair. And I saw the look in her face. Oh, snap. And I picked her up and I slammed her to the ground. WWE style, full on, think about it. I was a big boy. She, my mom relayed to me, she went back into the kitchen and said, I won't do that again. <laughs> but I remember those fights and disagreements and, you know, I think about James and John and Sons of Thunder and all. And I remember that and I just, Oh, yeah, it just is natural. It is natural, but it shouldn't be. 
it should be. How, how many people do have I hurt with my judgment? How many Christians have I made suffer or feel less than? I will tell you one thing that I don't do, and, and, and it's okay, call me what you want. But people ask me what I want to be called. Todd. It's my name. It's a name mom and dad gave me. There are some communities that I am a part of, and I have shared that I don't want to be called Pastor Todd, but they call me Pastor Todd. Because in that community, I don't think it's appropriate. I'm not a pastor in that community. If you want to call me preacher, pastor, what, that's, that's fine. But if you ask truly what you can call me, you can call me Todd. Because I am a part of you and you are a part of me and we are all brothers and sisters. But that, in hindsight and behind us, It's not my job to make people suffer. How many of us have? I mean, we read scripture and we look at people and lives that they live and we place judgment on them. We even look at some and say they don't belong and yet they have too made a profession of faith. And we leave them alone. That's why I always say we have to be ready, arms open wide, because the truth is, the reality is in our present culture, Big C Church is dying. At best, it's a push. But it's not necessarily the numbers that are dying. There are churches smaller that are dying and they're going to bigger churches and we are losing a part of our culture within the Christian community that dives into small communities. And if you have problems sociologically, mentally, uh, financially, in small communities, those things are seen. It's like the spotlight comes up on them when they happen. When you become ill, your name almost goes on a prayer list instantly. If you're a part of this congregation, there's prayers and often food comes with it because you're loved. There'll be phone calls and cards. I think about Barbara Kane now sitting at home with cancer and she's still sending out cards to people. And we can't lose that. But then there are some churches that are small literally because they have chosen to be because they have decided we're going to kick people out. We talked about that last week. New Beverly, Old Beverly Church. What Peter is reminding us of is yes, if we suffer, God is there. Nothing should ever be easy or the same if you truly want to follow Jesus Christ. It's just not a reality. It's rough, it's difficult. Often it is us that is hardest upon ourselves. But what I would say to you is that Jesus Christ doesn't find joy in suffering or in your suffering. What we can do and we rely in and when we find we are suffering is we can rely on Christ who said what? I will never leave you nor forsake you. And sometimes it feels like he has. 
the reality is is the Spirit of God will never leave you nor forsake you. The sad reality is is sometimes the people of God do. We must always challenge ourselves in the midst of suffering to replace our judgment with God's judgment. And we must always ask the question, am I the victim? Or am I the aggressor? We must always point the way to Christ, not simply with an action of an arm pointed up to look at the cross, But we must do so with arms open wide. And many times we must do so with words of I'm sorry that I have caused you pain. It happens. It happens passively sometimes. I've seen it before person passes away and a family member never comes to the church to tell them that we didn't do enough to keep up with them. It's not intentional, but sometimes it happens. But then sometimes it is intentional. Have you ever heard church people mock people that are in need And we simply say, well, if they wanted it, they would work a little bit more or get a better job. That's judgment. Did you think to ask them what happened? Did you think to ask them why? Did you think to consider them? Were you curious or judgmental? Sometimes we look at people and we simply belittle them. You wouldn't be a drug addict if you depended upon God. I can tell you right now, people I know, that is not a reality. There are many people that are addicted to many different things. And they still are followers of Christ. Sometimes it's difficult to break those addictions. But we as God's people, as Christ's hands and feet, are to place ourselves in the bowl of suffering with them and walk with them as we can. It's the age-old story, at least within my lifetime, the man that falls down the hole and while he's in the hole he can't find a way out and continues to scream hey hey can you help me down here help me help me please I can't get out people come over look down the hole keep on going by somebody walking by says hey I know that voice goes over looks and says hey what's happened what are you doing down there guy looks says hey I'm stuck in the hole I need to get out. Guy says, okay, just a second. He jumps right in. Guy looks at him and says, what in the world are you doing? Now we're both stuck down here. The friend looks at him and says, ha, oh, yeah, I was stuck down here last week. I know, I know the way out. Sometimes that's our calling to jump in with those that are suffering. You can find comfort in knowing 
that there are many in this world when you are suffering that suffer with you. But don't take a passage that Peter writes in order to be a blessing. We do find strength because if everything was going great all the time, we would find no reason to rely upon Christ. But don't take a passage of Scripture and use it as a method to say, well, you're suffering, just consider it a blessing. You have to go the step further. Peter is not the author of our faith. Jesus Christ is the author of our faith. And it is up to us to follow that path, to never leave those that are suffering. To always be with them and walk with them. And help them through this time to find hope and strength. I guess the best thing to say this morning is that this sermon is just not about 1 Peter 3, 13 through 22. It's about a this and we can't read one portion of scripture to not take in account the other portions we can find blessing in suffering because we learn strength we learn perseverance and we learn to rely on Christ but one it doesn't mean you have to sit and wallow in the suffering Two, it doesn't mean you look at the person suffering and say, oh well. And three, it doesn't mean that you may not be one that may be causing the suffering. And to truly be a follower of Jesus Christ, we honestly follow that way open our arms with love. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me? Father, in your presence now, we have questions to ask. Where are we not being your hands and feet? And where do we cause pain? And we have even more questions, O oh God. For in our suffering, maybe at the moment or in the past, did we truly see you? Did we realize your presence among us and with us? And did we in some way find blessing through it as you led us, either by your spirit or by our family. Father, this day we ask these questions and we trust in time that we will see your answers. For you have not left us, nor will you ever. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn. Just a closer walk with thee. My prayer is that it is closer today.
blessings to you all this day. I hope you'll come and join us over at uh, the Paradise Acres. We, we refer to this as Pisgah Paradise over there that day. So we hope that you'll come, eat with us. Uh, it's on your own, but the fellowship is free. We don't charge for that. So come and join us as we worship. Uh, well, well, we worship. It's a part of worship. It's a part of blessing and God's blessing when we share meals together. But we'll let us pray a blessing on the food when we gather there, but also let's pray our benediction. Father, as we leave this place, we leave into a world that needs to know your love. But Father, it is also us that need to know your love. And we need to accept your mercy.